will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now I know if you read the context, Manny always said I ought to go by the context. They told me that in Bible school too, but uh, he's really talking about Israel. But I think if we're Christians and we're spiritual Israel are our lights anyway. And, uh, but that's a good verse. Isaiah 41 verse 10, fear thou not. I think a lot of people are afraid right now. I was uh, thinking about that a little bit. Back in high school, they had us read a book, uh, George Orwell, 1984. And uh, uh, I was looking up when that was written. I had Carol check it up on her phone this morning. He wrote that in 1949. It was published in 1949. His real name was Eric Arthur Blair. And really, I think it's a picture of the days we're living in. And uh, somebody says, what do you mean? Well, when he wrote that, basically he kept talking about big brothers watching you. And uh, today they have the potential, now over in Russia or China, I guess they were even tracking people who had the virus who didn't. And uh, they could do that here in America. Not any high technology country could do it today. And you know, if you study your Bible, go over the book of Revelation, Zechariah, and some of the other books, uh, you know that number 666? Some people think that's an 18 digit number, and they can number everybody in the world. It's clever. And uh, I don't know, but I know they've got your number, yeah. government. But God's uh, our God, not the government. Because some people, I think, they worship the government more. They think the government will take better care of them than God. I don't think the government's as big as God. I think he's bigger, don't you? And so I think I'll just put myself in God's hands. And somebody says, well, uh, you know, you ought to be a good citizen. That's true. And uh, a couple things I wanted to say about something like that. Uh, one of the verses is in uh, Matthew. In Matthew chapter 22, Remember, Jesus needed to pay taxes. Well, the Pharisees came and started questioning about all kinds of uh, questions. And they were trying to trip him up and get him in trouble. And they said, well, who should you pay tribute to? Should you pay tr tribute to, to uh, Caesar or God? And uh, they thought they had him. But, you know, I think he was always way ahead of them. Amen. I don't think he was. I know he was. And let's look at Matthew. Anybody bring their Bible? Hopefully somebody brought their Bible. If not, I'll read some verses to you. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 22. And it's this story about Jesus. And they come and they start questioning and they're trying to trick him and get him to say something that would get him in trouble. And uh, I want to read some of that. Matthew chapter 22, we're down to verse uh, 15. Matthew 22, 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might uh, entangle him in his talk. And they sent unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, uh, teachest thou the way of God in truth, neither uh, carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of man. So they're trying to flatter him, build him up there, but I think Lord. he knew their hearts, just like he knows all of our hearts too. We don't fool God. Amen. Verse 17, tell us therefore what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Well, let's see if he said no, then the government would be after him. And uh, if he said yes, then the religious people would be after him. So they thought they had him trapped, but they didn't have him trapped. Look at verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. Well, you know, in our money, it says in God we trust, doesn't it? But I think some people trust the government more. Mm. 
You, Adam. You, you're going to have to. I, I think you ought to respect the government as long as they don't pass laws saying we can't worship, can't pray, can't. So far, they haven't done that. They're trying, I can see putting restrictions on us. You know, we had the church building checked out for fires every year. And, you know, we don't want anybody getting hurt. I don't want anybody getting hurt trying to do this. But he says, show me the tribute money. So they showed him the money and they brought him a, a penny. A penny? Of course, Abraham Lincoln said uh, he liked being on the penny because everybody could have one of those. That's now, nice. everybody might not have a $100 bill or 20 but most people can get a penny, right? But I don't know why they brought a penny. I think they should have brought something bigger than that. And he saith unto them, whose is the image on the superscription? So whose picture's on there? Usually it's different presidents and officials, you know. Verse 21, then say, unto him Caesar's and they said unto him render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's amen and so I think we should separate the cars I think we should try to do as much as we can to get along with the government but I also think we'll have the right to worship God amen and freedom of speech thankfully some people got that put into our Bill of Rights Constitution and some we Baptist, have some of these rights you ought to be thankful you get to live in America. Some places you don't have the rights we have here. And so, uh, really in that 22nd chapter here, the first uh, verses 15, 22, he's talking about rendering tribute to Caesar and to God. And then verse 23 to 33, there's a woman there and she's been married s seven times. Well, they had a tradition back then of you were married and you had brothers and you died, then your brother married the, your wife. When she, mm -hmm. Of course, she wouldn't be your wife anymore. And they go through, they tell him this story about going through, she has seven husbands. Do you really believe that happened? Well, I don't know, maybe in Hollywood. But anyway, I think they were making up a story trying to trap him again. And he goes on and, and if you read down verses 23 to 33, uh, he talks about how one dies and other dies, goes through all seven husbands. Then they ask him the question, well, who is she going to be married to in heaven? And uh, he gives them a good answer. He said, we're going to be like the angels in heaven. We're not going to marry or be given in marriage. And uh, so they didn't catch him there either, you know. And so... Uh, that, that's what he talks about in verses 29, Matthew chapter 22, uh, down 29 to the end of 34, I think, I think it is here. Um, let's go down to around verse... Uh, okay, he's talking about the resurrection. Well, it is resurrection day, isn't it? And so go up here at verse 29, Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Now these are religious leaders he's talking to here, trying to trick him up, prove he's not the Son of God, he's not the Messiah, he's not the Savior, but the Bible teaches he is. And as we read these things, we're more and more convinced of verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the angel, as the angels of God in heaven. Is there a heaven? Yes, sir. Is God in heaven? Are you planning on going to heaven one day? If you're saved, you will. Verse 31, but, uh, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you uh, by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead. No, He's the God of the living. Even if my body dies, I'm going to live on, but then I'm going to be resurrected and get a new body, just like Jesus did. Verse 33, And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at His doctrine. And so then the, the last uh, part I wanted to get to here, it's uh, verses 34 uh, to 40, uh, 
what's the first and great commandment? And uh, so go down here to verse uh, 34. And when the Pharisees heard, uh, had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, now the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And so he kind of stopped them. Now he moves on to the Pharisees. Well, they believed in, kind of believed in it. They were real traditional. They're more fundamental like us, right? Oh boy, I believe the Bible. And uh, I had one fellow some years back, they were got in a big discussion in Sunday school about uh, will little babies be in heaven? If you lost a little baby and you get to heaven, will they still be a little baby? And I got to be the referee and one lady said yes. And one fellow in there, he said, no, he said, I take the Bible literally. And it says in the Bible, we're going to be like Christ. And he was 33 years old. Well, I think sometimes you can get too little. You go too far past what the Bible really says. But when the Pharisees had heard that, he had put the Sadducees to silence. They were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, boy, he must be smart. He's a lawyer, right? Doctor of jurisprudence, probably. But I think he's talking about Old Testament law. Asking him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Boy, they were doctor of theologies, right? And they knew all about the law. And they, and they said, Master, which is the great commandment? Well, I don't know. Is it the first, second? You know, you got ten commandments, right? And uh, he comes back and he gives them an answer to that one. Verse 37, Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Do you love the Lord this morning? Amen. Well, you probably do if you're out here, right? You know, I never have gotten in traffic jams on going to church on Sunday morning. I've gotten in some going to races and ball games, but not going to church. But it amazes me. I think we've got more people here today than we have when we have church in the building. Amen. Maybe it's because it's different or strange. I don't know. But then he, he said the first and great commandments, what? To love the Lord thy God with all the heart, mind, soul, everything you've got. Verse 39, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then it goes on, verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. Well, should we love the Lord first and then love everybody else? But if we love the Lord, I think we'll love everybody else more. Amen. But if we don't, we're not right with God, we're probably not going to be right with other people. So where, where should we really start? Getting right with God. And so I think you'd need to be saved, living for God, and not uh, letting the devil can get a hold of you. Let the old nature get the best of the new nature. And then I, I've got two more sermons I could preach. I could just stop there. Did mention the resurrection, didn't it? But uh, you know the resurrections in all four gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John. And then we'd say, "Well, now which one would we pick?" And I looked at all four of them and read through them. Getting ready for today, we we'll ought to be reading our Bible, shouldn't we? Amen. And uh, also, we ought to be going to church. Uh, I was going to give you a couple verses on this. You know, a church is a called out assembly. Somebody says, well, uh, we're called out from the world if we get saved, aren't we? And we're put into the body of Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we get saved. And we're part of the true church. And somebody says, oh, that must be the Baptist church. No, it's anybody that trusts Jesus as their Savior repents of their sins. But you got to truly repent of your sins. I don't want to just emphasize, well, I say a few words. But I think it's good for us to assemble together. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to God's works. Good works. So we ought to be gathering together and encouraging each other to live for God and to do right. 
I think that's what church is about. It's kind of like a family, isn't it? Well, I guess families can stay together even through this pandemic. Then the next verse says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves, ourselves together. Somebody says, well, it's dangerous right now. We might contaminate all the people around us. Well, that's why we try to separate and be careful. Amen. But we haven't had church now in about a month in our church building. And uh, I think it's good just to get to see each other, Amen. even if you had to see them from 10 foot away. Is that a good thing or not? Well, I can't hear you yelling amen. Amen. I'm sure you all are, though. <laughs> but he says, Not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day Approach. approaching. Do you believe we're getting closer to Jesus coming? Well, look at what's going on. Could they number everybody? Could... Uh, Two guys get killed over in Jerusalem, lay, in the, lay down dead for two or three days, and then stand up, and everybody in the whole world could see it? Well, okay. when the Bible was written, that wasn't possible. Is it possible today? Yes, sir. Could they number everybody and keep track of everybody? And if you don't have a mark in your hand or your forehead, you can't buy or sell? Could that happen today? It couldn't have happened when the Bible was written. But God knew it would come. Amen. And I believe we're there. And uh, so if we go to Mark, you know, it talks about the resurrection morning. Now, I, I was nice to you. We, we set this at one in the afternoon, but part of it, Manny's working night shifts, so it's hard for him to get up early. I know a little bit about that. I did that for about 40 years. Same, and sometimes got off at 7 o'clock in the morning and came and preached. Taught Sunday school, taught the night service, and went back to work that night. But I was a little younger then. And uh, I don't know if I could do that now. Some things I can't do that I used to do. But now we're going to look at Mark chapter 16. Now I want to warn you, some people say part of these verses aren't in the Bible. But uh, they're in my Bible. Amen. So I'm just going to say they're my Bible and God wrote them and I'll just trust the Lord about that. But we're looking at Mark 16 and I'm, I'm getting near the end. So I know I'm kind of a long preacher, but Mark said Dad's got that big black book and he gets up and he reads and reads and reads. When he was a young kid, he said that. I don't know what he thinks now. He's here, though. Amen. I think the Lord is able to be here. He's been having an awful time walking. Carol's been having problems with her heart. But I believe she's getting somewhat better. I, I just got a feeling, though, by the time the day's over, she'll be pretty worn down. So you might pray for her. Pray for all the people on the prayer list because we have been passed out prayer lists. Maybe we could put one on the internet somehow. But in Mark chapter 16, it starts out in the beginning, the unexpected miracle. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. So they wanted to anoint his body. They're coming to the grave on Easter Sunday morning, first resurrection. And very early in the morning, not at one o'clock in the afternoon. Some churches have sunrise services. But uh, that's kind of hard sometimes. Verse 2, and, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Sunrise services. So there's scripture for that. Verse 3, and they said among themselves, who shall roll away, us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher. Well, I think God will. Amen. God did. Uh, that was unexpected. They thought they would get there and the stone would be there. How are we going to get that stone rolled away so we can anoint his body? But uh, something unexpectedly happened. They got there and the stone was rolled away. Uh-oh. 
verse 4. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. They were afraid. Some people are afraid right now. Well, if you're saved, I don't think you have much to be afraid of. Amen. You're going to win one way or the other. We're all in God's hands. I like John 10, 27, 28, 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. Amen. And so we're in God's hands. Verse 6, And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Don't be afraid. I believe it's an angel they're talking to here. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Well, you can see his empty grave, but he's not here. And some of the others says that he's up in heaven on the right hand of the Father. I, I kind of believe he went and took his blood to heaven and put it on the mercy seat in heaven. Some believe that, some don't. But I think there's scripture for it. I'd try the book of Hebrews and some different places. Verse 7, But go your way, tell his disciples, and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. Well, I think the Lord has been trying to tell them that he had to die, that he had to be buried, and three days later he'd resurrect. But I don't believe they got it. Sometimes I don't. Th I think the preaching goes over our heads. It has mine. Maybe, you know, I'm even reading my Bible sometimes. I'll read and I'll think, what did I just get through reading? So then I have to go back and reread it. But sometimes I'll quit and get up in the morning when I'm fresh and read it then because I can concentrate better. Carol's having trouble with her concentrating with some of the medicine they put her on and stuff. And that frustrates her. But a lot of people, as they get older, have more problems with that. But they were looking for Jesus. They got there. The stone was rolled away. An angel. Were they expecting all that? Apparently not, because they didn't know how they were going to get the stone rolled away. Verse 7, But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. Did they see him after the resurrection? If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 500 people saw him at one time. He appeared to the disciples several times. Thomas wasn't there one time, but Thomas was there the next time. Amen. Not good to miss church. Thomas missed out, didn't he? Verse 8, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man for they were afraid well you know they're wondering what was going on i wonder what's going on right now in the whole world with all these people getting this virus and i don't know god knows i'm, I'm trusting the lord Amen. and so then the next thing the unbelievable message verses 9 through 14 what's the unbelievable message now when jesus was risen early the first day of the week he appeared First to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Well, I think she probably was thankful she got saved and the Lord changed her life. Verse 10. And she went and told them that uh, had been with him as they mourned and wept. Here they're weeping. Jesus died. A lot of people weep at funerals. You ever weep at a funeral? But if you're a Christian, do you have hope? Will you see that loved one again? If they're saved and you're saved? Amen. They were going to see, we're going to see Jesus again too, weren't they? And so will we. Verse 11. And they, and they, when they had heard that he called, was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. First, they didn't believe it. That's the people that were his followers, the disciples. Unbelievable message. They had a hard time believing it. Now, today I don't have a hard time believing it because I got a whole Bible. They didn't have all this. 
Verse 12, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they, they them. So a lot of people didn't believe it. There's some people today that don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. But if I remember right, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thy name that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. saved. So we have to believe it in our heart. And then maybe we ought to tell somebody else about it. And so the unbelievable message, Jesus rose from the dead, didn't he? Amen. After he had appeared unto the eleven, well, why wasn't it twelve? One betrayed him. As they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not uh, them which had seen him after he was risen. risen. So even though some said, well, we saw him, some still didn't believe. We read the Bible, there was a bunch of people said they saw him. You have to choose whether you believe or not believe. We have to make a choice. Somebody, oh, I'm not going to make any choice. Then you made a choice not to believe. Then you got the ultimate mandate. What are we supposed to be doing today? Well, now from verse 9 to the end of this chapter is not supposed to be in the Bible. Is that, isn't that what they say, Manny? That's what I heard. From verse 9 to the end of the chapter, I think they'd leave out the resurrection. Pretty much. Well, that'd be, I believe that'd be bad. But if you believe the resurrection, what, what's the God wants you to do? What's the mandate? What's the commission? What's the job God's given us? Verse 15, And he said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are you guys creatures? Well, created in the image of God. We didn't evolve from some lesser life form. Verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall not shall be damned. Now some people believe you got to be baptized to be saved. I believe if you trust Jesus, you repent of your sins, you can be saved. I believe you ought to get baptized if you want to be obedient to God. And I mean a little narrow, I think you ought to get immersed, not sprinkled. That's more of a picture of a death, burial, and resurrection. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be Damn. Now what's repeated there? Baptism or the believing? The belief. The believing. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not. It didn't say that he's baptized not. And so some people take that verse and they don't notice it stops there and starts again. But Verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them you know we'll be around until god decides it's time for us to go what is it hebrews 9 27 pointed unto man wants to die but after this the judgment uh, these early believers they didn't have a bible they couldn't go down the street and read verses out of our bible to tell people how to get saved so god gave them something to get people's attention some miracles. Now, sometimes I wish the Lord give me a few. But miracles are kind of rare. But He gave me a Bible, Amen. and I believe the miracles in the Bible really happen. And so I go around telling people that, but some say, well, how come we can't do all this? Now, I'm not going to get me a glass of poison and drink it to prove my faith. I'm not gonna play around with a rattlesnake. Some do. Some have gotten bitten and died. Some have gotten bitten and got real sick. But I remember Paul, he was picking up wood and the snake grabbed on his hand. He shook it off in the fire and didn't die. They looked at him, what happened? It's a miracle. Amen. But we've got a Bible today. 
And I believe what the Bible says. And so, so I'm not going to play with the snakes. And some think you have to speak in other tongues. Well, we got a few people in our church can speak in other tongues. Amen. They can speak Spanish and English. Gloria a Dios. <laughs> but I think this tongues in the Bible are a different thing than that. But all Paul said, I can speak in tongues. He can speak several languages. Now, I don't know. Maybe God gave him the gift to be able to talk to people that he, in a language he didn't even know. But it's not an unknown gibberish tongue that people use Amen. in the Bible. Now verse 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Where's Jesus at? Is He on the cross? If you don't go past the cross and go on to the resurrection, you're in trouble. Jesus is not still on the cross. Right here it says, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sits on the right hand of God interceding for us. Now verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. I think they needed those miracles. Sometimes I'd like to have a miracle. I believe I've seen a few in my life. Somebody says, really? Well, I think one time they told my mother she had cancer and all the doctors. But you know, they went and did surgery and they cut in there and couldn't find any cancer. But then some years later, she got cancer in her lungs. And I prayed for the Lord to let her live through that one. But she didn't. She's in heaven. I think the first time it wasn't time to go. We're in God's hands. You need to trust Jesus as you're saved. You need to believe He rose from the dead. And then we need to tell other people about it. Well, I don't really have a, an invitation hymn, but let's bow our heads and we'll dismiss in prayer. And be careful backing out and everything. And I pray that you be safe. And if somebody needs help, call us and we'll see what we can do to help people. We've been calling around trying to check on people. I, Jim usually be here, but he's real pretty bad diabetic. And he doesn't really miss too much. He's almost here in all the services, but I've talked to him on the phone. He's okay. He said, uh, he said I don't have everything I want, but I've got everything I need. Amen. That's something to be thankful for, isn't it? And what we need. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship. We pray that you watch over all of our people and be with the ones on the prayer list. Pray with all the people that are struggling with this virus, Lord, and all the things going on in the world and uh, people out of work and can't afford food and uh, necessities. And a lot of people are getting by okay, Lord, but we especially want to pray for the ones that are struggling and, and have needs. and. Pray that you'd send people to uh, intercede and to help them with their needs. In uh, Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I appreciate everybody coming. And could, could you hear me okay?